everyone. Thank you for tuning in for our last session of Veterans Advanced Energy Week. We hope that you were able to join us earlier for our networking session in partnership with Solar Ready Vets. If you weren't, I hope you check out their program. It's great for transitioning veterans interested in the solar field. My name is Maggie Jackson. I'm Deputy Director for Climate and Advanced Energy at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. And for our veteran audience, I'll also share that I'm a former service warfare officer. I'm delighted to moderate this conversation this afternoon with Mr. Richard Kidd, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Environment and Energy Resilience. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes from me. This event is on the record and we are currently live streaming on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We encourage you to post about what you hear today and share on social media using the hashtag Vets Energy Week and by tagging us at AC Global Energy and Vets underscore energy. If you would like to participate in our conversation, we encourage you to submit your questions in the Q&A portal located at the bottom of your screen at any time during the event, and we will incorporate them after Mr. Kidd's remarks. Please note, however, that only those engaging directly via the conference app will be able to submit questions. Now, moving to today's conversation, we are thrilled again to host Mr. Kidd. As I mentioned, he's Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Environment and Energy Resilience. He is a third generation Army officer, and he also shared with me that at the same time, his father, two uncles, and one aunt were all serving on the ground in Vietnam. He has served in, as a senior executive in several federal agencies, including the White House. Mr. Kidd, we are thrilled to have you today. We are very interested in hearing your perspective on how the Department of Defense is thinking about climate change and the energy transition. We heard earlier in April, uh, Secretary Austin share that there is little about what the department does to defend the American people that is not affected by climate change. And we know that climate is front and center of President Biden's foreign policy and national security priorities. And in addition to that, we know that uh, your department is really at the forefront of clean energy innovation and development. So for our audience uh, today of veterans, military service members, and military spouses, your message is very salient. We look forward to hearing how DOD is integrating climate into military planning, training, and operations the importance of climate and energy resilience and how DOD is fostering again to lead in ener clean energy development and emissions reduction importantly. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn the floor over to you. Uh, Maggie, thank you very much uh, for that, that kind introduction and thanks for the Atlantic Council for having me here today. And uh, thanks to everyone in the audience for taking time uh, to listen. You know, it's hard for me to look All right, it, it's hard for me to look across my family tree and not find a veteran. And uh, so it's, uh, it's a special privilege for me to be here today and talk to this audience. When we talk about energy and climate change, it directly affects the Department of Defense and its service members. Fuel gives us an operational advantage over our adversaries and has contributed to our victories in the past. More recently though, fuel has been a vulnerability that our adversaries are exploiting, whether it's in ground convoys, in Afghanistan and Iraq, or the challenges that we face in delivering fuel across the Indo-PACOM. So I'm gonna to try to talk about quite a bit today, climate change, the implications for the department and how we're responding, and, uh, and to leave some time for questions. So as Maggie said, the department, uh, uh, the, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Austin, has made many strong and compelling statements about the reality of climate change and how it is a factor in the national security equation of the country. The science is very clear. We have to get to net zero carbon emissions by 2050, or we risk catastrophic outcomes in a manner that will disrupt you know, American life, prosperity, and welfare, the same as any adversary would. So recognizing this, we have to move forward uh, with deliberation and purpose in meeting the goals and objectives of the, the White House and following the best science available. As we do that though, uh, the department is trying to do so in a way that aligns our responses with our mission requirements. And so you're gonna hear that theme throughout my remarks. And I'd like you to take away that the department is not embracing climate change at the expense of our capabilities or at the expense of our mission, but integrating it in, recognizing that it is a re reality and that the way we respond can make us stronger against all adversaries, whether it's adverse weather or cyber attack. 
So climate change has three implications for the department. Number one, operational requirements. Our operational requirements are going to go up as states begin to fail, as migrations become larger and more prevalent, as we have to respond to humanitarian uh, response overseas, or you know, as we have to meet uh, defense support for civil authorities. A few days ago, my West Point classmate, General Dan Hokinson, Chief of the Guard Bureau, was outlining the National Guard's response, and he says the National Guard no longer has a fire season to prepare for. We have a fire year. So that's the Chief of the Guard Bureau just four days ago, recognizing the reality of how climate change is placing demands on our force. And if the Guard is fighting fires, they're not preparing you know, to, for their wartime mission. They're not doing their summer AT training or their weekend trainings. They're fighting forest fires. So, so this has effects on readiness. The second area where climate change has impacts for the department is on our installations. Last year, Tyndall Air Force Base was destroyed in a Category 5 hurricane, costing us $5 billion as a department. Fort Hood uh, and, and uh, Fort Carson have been unable to train and use their rangeland due to wildfire. We've had training uh, activity curtailed due to water, sh water shortages. Meanwhile, we've had roads and, uh, and training land destroyed due to flooding. Our installations are under pressure. They're where we live, where they're where we build readiness, and they're under threat. Finally, we have to think of our service members and their equipment. 36 degrees wet, wet bulb Celsius. That's the temperature outside where you cannot do your job, whether it's an, sorry, my computer's randomly uh, cutting out on mute, uh, so I'll watch that. You can't do your job as an infantry soldier. You can't do your job on the deck of an aircraft carrier. You know, you can't do your job wherever it is at 36 degrees Celsius because your body can't keep you cold and you're cool enough to operate and you'll start to die. So we have this challenge of making sure that we own the heat, that we have tactical cooling in all of our equipment. Just like our soldiers are being degraded, so is our equipment. United Kingdom can no longer use some of its older destroyers in the Gulf in the summer because they cannot keep them cool. They have to choose between keeping the electric components cool or the engine cool compromising speed or compromising combat effectiveness. So this is the reality and these are the three impacts for the department, operational requirements, installations, and service members. So the Department of Defense has a number of responses going on. We have an adaptation response. So adaptation is, 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 is managing the unavoidable. So uh, we have written a climate adaptation plan it's, uh, it's finished, it's uh, ready to go. We're waiting for the White House to allow us to, to release that plan. It's crafted like a military strategy. We have a defined end state, which is to ensure the department can operate under changing climate. Preserving operational capability and enhancing natural and man-made natural and man-made systems that are essential to the department's success. So we have an end state. We have five lines of act, uh, of effort in that campaign uh, climate adaptation plan: climate-informed decision making, training equip uh, training and equipping a climate-ready force, resilient built infrastructure and environment, supply chain resiliency, and adaptation adaptation through collaboration. Also, in terms of our response, we have a mitigation uh, plan that is uh, out there. This is what many of you are probably more familiar with. In, in many cases, mitigation is, is avoiding the unmanageable. So this is reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. If we were a nation state in the United Nations, the Department of Defense would be the 55th largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. So we have to adapt and we have to mitigate. We also have to adjust our our policies and strategies. So climate change is going to be part of a climate risk assessment and the national uh, defense strategy, which are both under preparation right now. But the key to that adaptation and the mitigation is to build installation resilience. So we are now requiring an all hazards threat assessment of our installations. The installations must build an installation resilience plan, which includes an energy plan, and they must have a financing component to that, we are going to prioritize along mission uh, essential installations and um, activities within installations. Uh, and we've got a lot of money coming from Congress. So our, our Energy Resilience Conservation Improvement Fund is uh, is on its pathway to doubling in four years. And 
and we could see it increasing even more in the future. Essentially, the technician, the technologies that we're going to use to help build resilience are cyber secure microgrids with on-site power generation. We're going to favor uh, uh, clean power generation sources, solar and um, solar and battery storage, you know, jump out at that, but not exclusively if the mission requires, uh, you know, if the mission requires some baseload fossil fuel, that'll be part of the mix at least for a while. We're gonna look to improve the performance of our buildings and uh, we're, we're gonna look to future technologies, whether it's small modular reactors, power beaming, uh, super high efficiency PV, uh, these are all things that are in the mix, and we have a dedicated program of cooperation, ESTCP and CERTIP, where we work with the Department of Energy to bring technologies to DOD and help them bring them to market. And speaking of the market, look, the market is changing, all right? The private sector is, a, is adjusting very quickly to the reality of a, of a, of a climate change impacted world. Renewable energy increased by 40, renewable energy installed capacity increased by 45% last year. That's the largest one year gross ever. 90% of the new capacity added last year was renewable energy. And in this year, the first quarter of 2021, even though we were suffering, um, uh, even though we were suffering uh, through the challenges of COVID, it was the highest ever quarter for PV installation here in the United States. Likewise, vehicle manufacturers uh, are, are recognize the need to transition to zero emission vehicles and fleets. You know, you've got Ford, Volvo, GM, VW, and Mercedes have all made commitments to fielding electric vehicles. What's interesting for Volvo and Mercedes, they made a commitment last year, and this year they've already increased it. So the market is adjusting uh, and, uh, and is looking very favorable to the uh, to the United States. Uh, two energy uh, uh, Intelligence firms, Bloomberg New Ener Business Intelligence firms, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and Navigant predicted that the Department of Defense will be one third of the market for microgrids and large scale uh, battery storage. And I'm going to do my best to prove them right. Uh, and we're going to emphasize uh, these technologies going forward. But let's be clear, right? This is not a free and fair market. OK, for the last 20 years, the United States has had a false debate about climate change and picking winners and losers. We've always picked industries that were of strategic importance to the United States. West Point, the institution I went, uh, I went to and graduated from, was in part founded to produce civil engineers to subsidize transportation industry in the United States. So we've always done that. We've had a false debate for 20 years, and China, on the other hand, has embraced clean energy technology. They know that the nation that wins the race to the clean energy future wins. They are the majority producer of PV, of, uh, of, of photovoltaic arrays, of wind turbines, of, of batteries in the world. They're the largest installer of these systems. They're moving up market to energy and power controls, and they are competing uh, globally. And they are weaponizing this as they go out and about and say, look, we're here to help other countries transition while the United States is not part of the solution. So we need to recognize that China is harvesting its economic and its diplomatic influence to challenge us in the competition for the clean energy future. So recognizing this, um, uh, I'd just like to close by saying, hey, look, there's a few things that veterans can do. And, you know, veterans in and out of uniform serve this country you know, from day one. Uh, and uh, one is to, man is to demand that climate-informed public policies exist at all levels. So I've talked about resilience on our Army installations, but look, you all need to expect resilience in your local towns and communities, your schools, your households, all right, the roads, transportation networks, the power generation systems, the power grids, uh, uh, the water capture and the water supply systems. All of these things that we have built, much of that has been built on the model of efficiency, needs to be reconfigured around, around the model of resilience. Uh, second, you need to support, you know, national initiatives around key industries and technologies, you know, particularly batteries, power control, next gen PV, small modular reactors. These are the technologies that give an America an advantage and we've got to get there first. And then where and when you can, you know, if you can uh, and can adjust your pricing, uh, your, your own personal consumption habits to accelerate the uptake of new technologies. You know, remember when the first flat panel 
flat panel TV came out, it was like $13,000 and no one's, everyone said, well, that's crazy. Who's going to buy those? Well, fortunately for us, a lot of rich people bought them, drove the price down, and now we've all got flat panel TVs in our house. So I drive an electric car. Others drive an electric car. I pay $7 a month for a renewable energy premium on my, my energy bill. These are all things that I do uh, personally to help advance the clean energy uh, uh, revolution, the clean energy future that America needs. Um, I'm going to wrap it up there. Uh, I did. I, I covered quite a bit in uh, in 10 minutes, but I'm happy to take questions. So back over to you, Margaret, and the audience. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. You did cover a lot, of, and we can unpack some of that. And I saw we have not a question, but a comment come in. Nick, thanks for sharing that. But I will encourage the audience, please ask questions. This is an amazing opportunity to engage with, with Mr. Kidd. But I, I wanted to pick up on, on what you said uh, just in, in your closing there and about kind of personal responsibility and consciousness around these issues. And I will admit when I was serving in, in the Navy, again, on a ship, we, I was a navigator. I was worried about getting from point A to point B. And certainly we thought about fuel consumption. We thought about the costs. We thought about the logistics and, and the headache of where to rendezvous and things like that. But climate change and emissions were not part of that conversation. So how... Um, are, are you seeing any shifts around energy and climate consciousness, energy use and climate consciousness in the fleet? And, and how can uh, we improve awareness or what initiatives do you already have? You talked a little bit about integrating climate and you know, energy efficiency into training and operations. I imagine that's where it starts. But um, because there is a very human element of this, not only in, in the operational sense, but also in the in, in the innovation piece of how we think about solutions and doing this a bit better. Right. So when we talk about when we talk about energy in the operational sense, we don't normally talk about conservation per se. We talk about capability. How can we get the most capability out of the given unit of fuel? And when we talk about capability, it, it makes a lot of sense and we can model uh, um, decisions around the added capability that we gain from um, from uh, um, improving the fuel efficiency of our various vehicles. So a couple of initiatives in the department, we now build a senior leader dashboard for Secretary Austin. So while we'll never put a goal on operational energy, so like on, on, on non-tactical vehicles, we have a goal to reduce of petroleum consumption in, in field zero, zero emission vehicles. We won't do that on operational energy per se, but, we'll, we'll, but we will start to track by different platforms and take a look at ways that we can save significant amount, amounts of energy. And just by doing that, we realize the largest energy consumer in the department and the largest greenhouse gas emitter is the C-17. And saving 2% on the C-17, uh, you know, is worth uh, I'm not sure I got the exact ratio right, but it's worth a huge percentage of our Humvee fleet just because of the difference in the fuel consumed by, by that aircraft. And this is driving some investment decisions in terms of winglets and microvanes. Where er, earlier today, I just had a presentation from an aircraft manufacturer who's talking about a new engine for the F-35. It, it, it adds capability, it adds range, it adds thrust, and oh, by the way, it uses 21% less fuel while doing so. So adding capability is is what we think about when we when we think about operational energy i would just you know ask people to do a uh, a little thought a, a little thought experiment here so the science tells us very clear that by 2050 we have to be net zero carbon emissions but we know right now if you think to the future probably the last gallon of fossil fuel that's ever burned will probably be burned by the Department of Defense, an aircraft, a ship, or a tank. So that being the case, we as a department also have to think about how we're going to sequester or offset carbon emissions post-2050. And the last thing the Department of Defense needs to do or wants to be is, is the last greenhouse gas emitter in America. So that is not the distinction that we, we want to have by 2050. Thanks. Thank you for that. And I do, I do think that's such an important point to underline that 
it's not necessarily about consciousness or emission instructions, as you said, it's, it's about improving force agility and capability and war fighting effectiveness. And I, I think it's not a, a give and take. Um, I, we do have a question that, that came in about uh, what are DOD's plans for incorporating global climate data and analytics into military planning for stability operations in regions of national interest? And I think this this broader question of, of just better data and analytics, I think, is a really important one and, and not one that we've gotten to yet. No, that's a that's a great question. So the Department of Defense has what's called the Defense Climate Assessment Tool, which is, you know, leverages the great expertise in engineers and scientists of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers from their civil works uh, experience and their fact that they're sort of the mapping entity for the department. So the Defense Climate Assessment Tool, we started on our installations. It gives you a sort of a first order assessment of what things will look like at that particular geographic location uh, across two time periods and two greenhouse gas emissions uh, scenarios. It takes a look at eight different impacts from drought, heat, riverine flooding, coastal flooding, uh, extreme weather, uh, et cetera. And uh, so we're, we, we've now deployed that and done the deep dive assessment at 1,400 of our installations worldwide. So we've started with our installations. We're, we're gaining the ability to do modeling uh, around various geographic regions, and then we'll start to incorporate that into the combatant commands as they look at their theater engagement plans and some of their you know, um, assessments for the future in terms of what are gonna be some of the threats that, that might exist in the region. So we're starting. Uh, it's going to increase over time. We've got some demonstrated capability, but we're looking to do more going forward. Thank you for that comprehensive answer. And I, I think you alluded to the fact that there's many other agencies across government that have expertise in this area. We know that the Air Force does a lot, um, NOAA, others. And, and on that note, we do have another question that's come in from Admiral McGinn about how that coordination is, is going across other departments and agencies. Uh, when it comes to, again, whether it's the resilience piece or clean energy development, I'd like to get to a question on clean energy uh, competitiveness, but I'll save that until uh, after this question. Yeah, so, so, so that's a great question, but let me digress for just a second. So coordination and interagency collaboration requires people. And uh, this government uh, across all agencies has suffered a tremendous loss of talent the last few years. And one of the messages I've been saying to political appointees uh, in, in the building in the White House is, is we do not have enough high quality staff to meet the expectations of this administration. And the first place to start is we've got to rebuild human capital, climate, create a climate literate workforce. I say that, uh, you, you know, then to answer Denny's question, I have, we in the Department of Defense have more collaboration venues and opportunities than we can keep up with. And so we are looking to staff up in, uh, in FY22. The staff in this office will double, uh, more than double. The staff in the services will also go up. And part of that is so that we can fulfill our, our obligations and the necessity to coordinate with others. And coordination and collaboration is, is a recognized line of effort within the Climate Adaptation Plan. I would just say that, you know, as far as the climate adaptation plan goes, the department did very well. And uh, we're working with other agencies. We're sharing our modeling. We're sharing some of our assessments. The DCAT has been uh, shared with a, a variety of agencies, some, some there and, you know, some on the Intel side. And uh, also shared, uh, uh, the president has offered this as a tool that we can share with our allies and partners. We're going to go over to Europe in, in October and, and demonstrate that tool and offer it up to our, some of our NATO, NATO partners. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. And, and yes, thank you for bringing allies and partners into that because I think that's a really important uh, note too. But going back to, to your point about staffing up um, and your message earlier to veterans about um, you know, maybe how they, how they think about their transition and what opportunities are out there. I wanted to share something that uh, we had, someone said in an earlier session, and he was asked to speak about his transition from service to the solar industry. And he said, I really want to talk about my transition from service to service in a different way. And some of the, the points you just made about needing to staff up 
um, in terms of, of government, do you see a path for veterans who are interested maybe in the policy space or working on some of the initiatives that you talk about, whether it's in DOD across government, um, maybe you could speak to first the extension of, of service in a different way, in a different form, and how that circles back to national security. And second, what tangible opportunities there might be just given this transition. Yeah, so I, I love the notion of lifetime service. It, you know, that's why, it, you know, for, for me, I, I've always turned down the opportunity to make money in order to keep serving, and I'll probably be cursed with that for the rest of my life. So I thank everyone who continues their service in, in other ways. And, uh, you know, it's so important that our veterans get back and engage in the public and continue that service ethic and, and go out to organizations and in, in industries that may not have the same service ethic that we uh, were and to share that with others. I mean, it really makes a difference when people feel like they're part of a team that matters and makes a difference. Um, so I would just encourage that. You know, and tactically, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, job openings at DoD, there's going to be a few. Uh, some of the job openings will be internal. Some of them will be external. So there'll be opportunities, I think, for qualified staff to to come to Washington D.C. if you want and work policy issues. I think that our garrisons across the department will be looking to add more energy managers, uh, environmental uh, experts, uh, resilience planners. So there's going to be an opportunity there as well as for the for the great companies that provide contractor services to the department. Thank you. Thank you for touching on that. I know that's not necessarily your lane of expertise, but I do appreciate uh, that call, just given, again, the mission of, of this Veterans Events Energy Project. But in the last few minutes, uh, I do want to ask a final question about DOD's role in building U.S. clean energy competitiveness. And you also, I, I thought, gave a very interesting example of how you really need to think um, about technology development and, and carbon, not just carbon capture, but carbon removal. And so how do you see DOD playing a role in this, um, and whether it's through procurement or research and development or other ways? Yeah, so I'll give you I, I, I'll give you an example that's near and dear to my heart. I'm I, I, uh, on a construction technology, but then I'll get to one that's I think a little bit more important. So I grew up in rural Oregon. You know, uh, uh, we're a timber town, and um, and the timber industry was devastated when we stopped cutting lumber and exporting logs to China. So the, 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 the industry here was devastated and, uh, you know, similar story all across America, the, the high value, the value add jobs go away, they go someplace else. So there's a, a technology out there called mass timber or cross laminate timber. So the army, uh, when I was there at the army, uh, we worked with our privatized lodging partner, a, a private company, and we built the first uh, cross laminate timber hotel in America. It's a large hotel. You wouldn't know it was any different from any other hotel. Uh, we've now built seven of those. At the time we built them, there was no manufacturing capacity in America. The 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 um, panels had to be imported in from Canada. As part of that project, we did a couple of things that we're so good at. We we blew the panels up. We lit them on fire. We tried to hit them with large objects to, to, to test their structural integrity. We did all of that testing and then we went back to the American industry, the American public and said, hey, this stuff works, all right? It saves energy, it, it's blast resistant, it's fire resistant, it works. There are now 10 manufacturing plants in the United States to produce cross laminate timber, creating high value, uh, steady jobs all throughout uh, all throughout the country with more under construction and this technology this this construction technology making its way forward it's more efficient than traditional construction and it actually sequesters carbon if you can certify that the wood is being uh, being re replanted so lots of benefits from this technology would the country have gotten here without the department yeah probably but i think we sped up that deployment process by two or three years switching to something that's a lot more important is batteries all right Every vehicle, every ship, every plane, every night vision de device, everything we do has batteries, right? And China has a national battery strategy that includes hoovering up all of the raw materials. It includes making these massive manufacturing plants subsidized and competing for market share across the world. The last thing we can do as a Department of Defense is 
be dependent on China for our battery supply chain. So can we use the purchasing power of the Department of Defense to bring battery manufacturing back to the United States to ensure both supply chain integrity and climate chain integrity for, for the batteries that we're using now and in the future. If that means buying some zero emission vehicles, if that means being a platform for, for battery storage systems on our installations, absolutely, that's important. It's strategically important for the country. We can't we can't be dependent on, on China or frankly anyone else for the batteries that we need and every piece of equipment in the department. All right, Maggie, so uh, thanks very much. Uh, I, I understand, you know, I'm just a warm up act. I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I'm like, a, you know, I, I'm like a, a bit player and you're about to get the Rolling Stones. So I need to exit stage and, uh, and let the let the true headliners come up here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mr. Kidd. This is a very insightful discussion. And and yes, I agree. It's it's time for me to, to get off the stage as well, um, because it's now my pleasure to uh, turn the floor over to Colonel uh, Greg Duque. He's going to kick off our closing discussion with Vice Admiral Denny McGinn. And again, uh, thank you to Mr. Kidd and, and over to you, Greg. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks, Richard. And uh, hello. And thank you for joining us as we close out a really spectacular Veterans Advanced Energy Week. My name is Greg Duque, co-director of the Veterans Advanced Energy Project and a senior fellow at Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. May I also introduce Vice Admiral Retired Denny McGinn. Uh, former hey, Greg. Great to be with you. Uh, uh, and uh, Denny, uh, just a bit of an introduction for you, uh, for our audience. Um, assist, former Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Energy and Environment, and now in private sector energy and climate security, where Danny is on the Board of Directors of Electric Power Research Institute and the Board of Trustees of the Rocky Mountain Institute. And perhaps most importantly, Danny is on our Veterans Advanced Energy Project Advisory Committee. So, so welcome to you, uh, Danny, and, and what a week of events uh, culminating with uh, Richard Kidd's uh, uh, tour de force uh, with regard to energy and environmental uh, climate security. What are what are what are your thoughts uh, on, on some of what Richard said, uh, particularly as it relates to climate ad adaptation plan and installation resilience? Greg, uh, we are so fortunate to have the kind of experienced leadership that is represented by uh, Richard Kidd. Uh, we first met when he was uh, over at DOE. We got over the. Uh, Army Navy uh, football rivalry stuff pretty quickly and uh, soon began uh, working uh, closely together. He is a national asset and uh, the department and indeed the nation is uh, fortunate to have him there. You could see from his remarks, he touched on uh, every aspect of it. Uh, first of all, defining the challenge of climate change in the three dimensions. And then also, uh, what, what do we do about it? How do we compensate for it in terms of mitigation and how do we uh, how do we adapt to uh, the climate effects that we're already dealing with? So it's just really, really important. And I think uh, his, uh, his uh, remarks go directly to the heart of what we're talking about with the advanced, uh, Veterans Advanced Energy Program. This is a national security priority. And when you think about it, our energy security, our economic security, and our environmental security are all inextricably linked. So when we do things with advanced energy, whether it's technology, policy, finance related, that has a direct contribution to our overall national security and our quality of life. And I think that uh, that ethic of service, that ethic of uh, it's all about the mission, it's all about teamwork, it's all about being competent and competent individually and together is just a natural progression for our veterans into the advanced energy uh, environment. Yeah, that's uh, that's so well put. Um, you know, you, you you've touched upon the bigger picture uh, of global energy with our uh, you know the fact that it's a global energy market. Um, earlier in the week, uh, Maggie led a, a, a panel on geopolitics of the energy transition, and uh, you know, kind of looking at those tectonic movements around the globe and how they how they affect uh, our economy. Uh, and our, our national security, as, as Richard so well pointed out. Absolutely. Uh, it is an international uh, challenge. 
uh, and it is also an international opportunity uh, in advanced energy, which goes so far to addressing uh, some of the most uh, significant challenges of climate change. We find job creation, we find uh, new ways of, uh, of producing energy, transmitting it, using it, storing it. And uh, that is uh, a very, very uh, great opportunity to, to seize, to turn this uh, or these challenges into opportunities. Uh, we have the Congress uh, debating a huge, uh, over half a, billion, half a trillion dollar infrastructure bill, Build Back Better, uh, wow, that's going to bring money. It's going to bring focus at the local, state, and national level. And it just creates a tremendous uh, surge of interest and opportunity for, uh, for veterans to uh, get into the energy space. So with the, with the global energy uh, market context, we also drilled way down and talked about clean energy jobs, something that's near and dear to our audience of uh, veterans yes. military spouses. Uh, we had a, a clean energy jobs panel with Acting Assistant Secretary James Rodriguez. We had AFL-CIO, uh, Union Veterans Council, William Attig. Um, we had a, 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 a workforce development firm, Airstreams Renewable, um, a, a recruiting firm. And, 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 and uh, Dylan Green, this firm surmised that advanced energy is a great opportunity for veterans and military spouses, but like any other major structural transition, in some cases, regulations, policy in the labor market aren't, aren't keeping up. That's true. Uh, it, it takes technology, it takes finance, and oh, by the way, the right kind of policies at various levels to, uh, to really get things happening. The good news is that uh, the awareness uh, in both the private sector and certainly in government at federal and state levels is there that we cannot continue to, for example, I'll use the example of the, uh, the electric grid. We have a very balkanized, uh, you know, false boundaries uh, across uh, state lines, if you will, and regional lines about how we produce and transmit uh, electricity. Those have to change. Uh, I know it's a it's an acknowledged uh, problem by the policy community, and uh, people are starting to look for ways. Whether it's uh, change in regulation where where permitted by by law and new law or legislative efforts where it's necessary to remove some of these false boundaries. Uh, to, that uh, it's all about how, how can we do it? Don't tell me the hundred or thousand ways we can't do something. Let's all get together and figure out how we can do something. Get the yes. You know, I appreciated Richard talking about uh, providing venue to continue to serve, both in the public, but also in the non the nonprofit and the private sector. Um, and, and indeed this week, uh, we certainly provided lots of opportunity for our veterans and military spouses to continue to serve in some of the fastest growing spaces in advanced energy. We had uh, hiring sessions uh, via recruiting companies uh, to include Airbus, American Corporate Partners, Deloitte, Dominion Energy, ENI, Goodleaf, Equinor, ISO, New England, San Diego Gas and Electric, Scale Microgrid Solutions, Silicon Ranch, Terra Power, Invenergy, Emerson, Alliance Systems, Airstreams, Renewables, and Apex Clean Energy. Quite a, quite a lineup. Denny, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts about the current state of the energy job market for our, our veterans and military spouses? It is booming. Uh, in my uh, whole life, in my, and especially my professional life, I have never seen better opportunities to get into the energy business. It's exciting uh, in every dimension. That is a galaxy of uh, stars, that, uh, of the companies that you, that you mentioned. Are, that are not just talking about things. They're, Greg, they're actually doing things. They're getting things done. Uh, companies like Equinor and, and other wind development companies are actually deploying uh, the, uh, the energy. Now it's mostly in Europe, but it's coming to the tune of 30 gigawatts, according to uh, the goals set by President Biden and the administration to the United States, both on the uh, Atlantic coast and the Pacific coast, and probably uh, pretty soon in the Gulf coast as well. So these uh, companies uh, are doing things that are new. They need new skills. They have the ability to train uh, people in those new skills. 
and uh, they are really, really already making a difference. But the challenges and the opportunities are so great, it's just going to expand. And of course, you know, no industry can grow unless there's proper policy and regulation. Uh, another point that we've been we've been touching upon throughout the week. Uh, this week, we uh, uh, had the benefit of a number of members of Congress, such as Senator Mike Brown and Congresswoman Marionette Miller Meek. Uh, talk to us about how uh, Congress is setting conditions, both in terms of uh, legislation, infrastructure plan, uh, transportation bill, uh, build back better, clean energy jobs, uh, but also those those all important uh, standards and regulations within which the advanced energy industry has got to operate. You know a lot about that, particularly with regard to uh, grid standards. Yeah, I'm really, really pleased, Greg, to see that uh, the politicization of climate change is going away. It's still there a little bit, but it's faded significantly. Mother Nature doesn't pick blue or red states to attack with uh, severe weather. We've seen that uh, uh, over the past uh, three to five years, uh, incredibly, with great cost. Uh, Richard Kidd mentioned uh, Tyndall Air Force Base is just one example of the panhandle of Florida. Five billion dollars to get that back and running. Can you imagine what that would buy in terms of real military capability and training if we didn't have to spend it on picking up after Mother Nature? So in the legislative sphere, uh, the, uh, the Congress really is starting to get it. We just can't continue to believe that uh, this is a temporary phenomenon, that there's nothing that we can do about it. There is plenty that we can do about it. There's plenty that we are doing about it. And uh, I think that uh, as we our veterans go forth and find speed bumps or roadblocks to progress, whether it's in policy or finance, uh, what have you, to enable the kind of technology that we need, we need to highlight that. And I think uh, our VAEP, Veterans Advanced Energy Program, is a good forum in which we can highlight and we're, we are well connected as part of the Atlantic Council with uh, the Hill, with regulatory uh, agencies, and we can really make a difference to identify and then to remove those uh, those uh, roadblocks. <clears throat> that's a that's a terrific segue, Danny, into uh, our, our Veterans Advanced Energy uh, fellows uh, who uh, were with us, as you know, all year. Uh, we provided Atlantic Council, Global Energy Center uh, mentoring for these uh, up and comers within the advanced energy industry, public, private, nonprofit, all veterans. And uh, this week we have the benefit of hearing some of their policy proposals to your point uh, to advance the industry. Uh, and just a couple examples of the kind of innovative thinking that we're seeing among uh, our fellows and across the, uh, the veteran and, and military spouse space, for example, um, John Gillis, uh, who is a uh, in Argonne Labs, a former Marine, um, suggested a federal program to establish EV charging stations across the country to promote yeah. EV adoption, which, as we know, is uh, <clears throat> all important. And there's also some standard regulation, uh, part and parcel of that with regard to the, the stand standard. Um, Jesse Medlong uh, proposed uh, federal tax incentives to private sector companies participating in employee based programs that reward a sustainable behavior, such as reducing energy usage and investing in clean energy. Uh, Taylor Searcy talked about an interagency program, uh, which we, we discussed earlier, your question to, to Richard about it, the importance of interagency coordination uh, to decarbonize US ports, uh, something you're well familiar with, Admiral. Sure. Given how energy intensive ports are. And uh, former uh, Navy Captain Robin Tyner uh, proposed establishing hydrokinetic plants in underserved rural communities to promote energy security. A lot of uh, really great ideas in, in moving us forward, Danny. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, you mentioned many, many different types of technologies with many different technology applications, whether it's uh, shipping. We didn't talk too much about aviation. One of the questions had to do with, uh, are we gonna see a migration towards different aviation and, and ship and, and the combat uh, vehicle fuels absolutely that uh, can do a lot of good for uh, uh, nascent uh, industries uh, it's good in the case of biofuels for uh, the rural economy uh, we are going to be seeing greater and greater demand by large segments of our economy whether it's aviation shipping manufacturing uh, commercial developments 
for the kinds of uh, energy options, energy tools that are going to get us to uh, eventually to a net zero carbon by uh, 2050 and, and even more, more so beyond. As we make that journey, we have to be mindful, and I hear this from uh, our utility partners all the time across the country. We need to be mindful on the path to, de to decarbonization of the need to maintain reliability of keeping the lights on, resilience to be able to respond to cyber threats or mother nature or mechanical failures, and also affordability. We, we've got to uh, get to that decarbonization and do it in a really, really smart way. That's where uh, veterans come in. With their, they know how to get the job done. They're innovative, they're teamwork oriented, and extremely talented. So I think that uh, that path to, to a decarbonization with reliability, resilience, and affordability is going to be a, a good one. Well, with that, uh, with that charge action, uh, Denny, um, thank you very much for this conversation, and uh, and thank you also to our team here at the Veterans Advanced Energy Project Global Energy Center. Um, and it is now my pleasure to turn it over to the Global Energy Center Director, Randy Bell, for final comments. Thank you so much, Vice Admiral McGinn and uh, Colonel Duque for your words of wisdom and uh, closing call to action for our veteran audience today after four really phenomenal days of programming. Again, uh, as Greg said, my name is Randy Bell. I'm the director of the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center and Richard Morningstar Chair for Global Energy Security. And it is my job right now to close out what has been a truly remarkable week. There's a lot that the Global Energy Center team does that I'm really, really proud of, but our annual Veterans Advanced Energy Week is, I think, probably the most meaningful and immediately impactful of all our efforts. It links high level policy conversations with the jobs and the people who can support those policy goals. There's, there's really nothing else like it. This year, over 250 veterans, reservists, military spouses, and active duty service members from around the country and around the world joined us in our panel conversations, energy film screenings, networking sessions, and recruiting sessions with 16 participating companies. We were so thrilled to have all of you join us this week. Thank you for your service to our country. We really hope you found this event useful. So throughout the week, we had over 65 speakers from Congress, the Departments of Energy, Labor, State and Defense, the private sector and civil society participate in engaging conversations on the energy technologies and policies of the future, the role of the Department of Defense in the energy transition, the prospect for the post pandemic energy employment landscape, and energy justice in tribal communities, among other topics, a really wide ranging set of conversations. And veterans from across the sector joined our program to share their experiences transitioning from service to the clean energy workforce. We want to encourage all of you to rewatch our conference content through the app or on the Atlanta Council YouTube channel. You reach out to the connections you've made throughout the week and make sure to connect with the company recruiters who participated over the past four days. All that information is available in the app and you'll have access to that for the full calendar year. Now, none of this would have been possible without the generous support of our sponsors. So I wanna sincerely thank this great group, um, Apex Clean Energy, Emerson Electric, Invenergy, American Resilience Project, American Clean Power, Consumers Energy, Georgia Power, ISO New England, Scale Microgrid Solutions, and the Truman Center for National Policy. I also want to thank all of our recruiting and participating companies and the veteran and HR representatives who took time to speak to our participants throughout the week. Finally, this conference would not have come together without the tireless work of our team. I want to thank Dan Mish and Greg Bouquet, who lead the charge as co-directors of the Veterans Advanced Energy Project. Zach Strauss and Maggie Jackson, chief organizers of Veterans Advanced Energy Week, and our tireless Global Energy Center interns, Nadia Udochi and Geronimo Gutierrez, and the whole of the Global Energy Center team, the entire Atlanta Council events team, communications team, editorial staff, the AV managers, Jackson Styron, Roger Morales, Peter Gonzalez, and the whole community of people who put this program together. It really takes a whole bunch of people to make this happen. 
on a final, uh, uh, somewhat sad note, but but um, but really, really fantastic for for our country. I would like to say a public thank you to Maggie Jackson, who, if you didn't know already, you got to know over the course of this week. Her last day at the Atlanta Council is tomorrow. She'll be starting a new role with the USG very soon. It's not yet public where she's going, but it is jaw-droppingly impressive. So please do congratulate her. Maggie, we will miss you, and we hope you come back to the council when this, this job is over. I also really want to give a personal thanks to Zach Strauss, who really, really just threw himself into this effort this year and did such a remarkable job. So thank you, Zach. Um, and with that, I want to thank everybody out in the audience one final time. Thank you for joining us this year, and we hope to see you again next year. Thanks so much.